Yeah, just bow with me one. Yeah, sit down if you can. In this old crazy world, it looks like, where's God? You know, well, he's working. He's still there. He has a plan and he's working and God is in charge of all of this that's going on around us. Every once in a while, I'll kind of get bent out of shape at it, you know, and I'll get aggravated and annoyed at everything I see and hear that uh, just an, just an assault against the truth and everything that it stands for. And, and I just have to remind myself every once in a while, well, God, you are in charge of this. So who am I angry at, you know? And uh, this word gives us all kinds of descriptions to tell us what to expect in these days. And um, it, it certainly hadn't disappointed because that is exactly what we seem to be experiencing, just as the word describes. And I know that uh, Jesus is on the horizon now, guys. So get ready, like OTD Jake said all the time, get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> yeah, get ready, because he is on the horizon. We're in a new series started last week called The Pretender. It's about the life of Jacob. And as I mentioned to you last week, just about anything in the Christian life you want to illustrate or talk about, good or bad, Jacob seems to be your man uh, because he had such a complicated and complex life and God worked with him through all of those areas of life. And last week, we started out by just basically looking at a message that encouraged you um, to be what God created you to be because uh, God couldn't bless Jacob dressed up in Esau's clothing and God can't bless who we pretend to be. So God has a person, God has a call on our lives and it's so easy to become somebody else or to, or, or to get going in, a, in the wrong direction and, because we're trying to uh, please someone or be like someone or make somebody happy or something. But y y you know, God says, look, y just be who I created you to be because I can bless that. And so today we're looking at another aspect of Jacob's life, probably, probably the worst negotiation in all of human history, where Esau sells his birthright for a bowl of beans, uh, bean soup, red bean, not red beans, lentils, which are a different kind of bean, but it was red and it was a bean soup. And this is such an odd story that it, it's almost hard to, 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 to take it you know, for real, it, it, it just it seems like who would do that? Just such a crazy little odd thing that you would sell the birthright, your birthright, double the money, everything, for a bowl of soup. Now, I'm thinking, all right, there has to be a word in this for us. And, and, and as I thought this week, I think, let's, let's just look at it. Do we do this kind of foolish stuff? All right, Genesis 25, here's the story, beginning at verse 24. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Chewbacca. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a shout out to you Star Wars people. Uh, when, I th when I read that, I thought, that's, that's what Chewbacca looked like, right? I mean, you have to admit it it, it, it was strange. I mean, certainly it's not normal. The little fellow comes out and said he looked like a garment he had on. He had so much hair on him. And they named him Esau, which means red hairy one. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called heel grabber, which is what Jacob means. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew. And Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, and Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, I, I see a problem coming right, right here. Verse 29, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and was wearied. Now that word weary is, is ayef in Hebrew, which you don't need to remember that, but it just means that he was, he was famished, he was exhausted, he was, he was thirsty, he was he just famished. He was at the point of collapse is what really it's getting. The word weary doesn't quite carry as deep a connotation as, as, as he was. Verse 30, and, and Esau said to Jacob, uh, please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red, by the way. And if the name Edom sounds familiar, 
Uh, it should because in the Bible we have some notorious characters that were always a thorn in the side of Israel called the Edomites. Esau became the father of the Edomites. But Jacob said, sell me, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is the birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me this day, uh, as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, which is a type of bean in that area. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. And then the saddest little sentence in, in the world, then thus Esau despised his birthright. Sad, sad ending, disrespected his birthright, took it lightly. Because the birthright, remember, was a double inheritance. So here we have Esau trading the double inheritance of a rich father plus all of the prestige and all of the honor that goes with the birthright for a bowl of soup. Who in here has a really nice car? I know, I know Holly, you have a new one, right? It's a Toyota 4Runner. It's really nice. It's, it's this new model, right? 2021. All right. Uh, well, here, I would like to trade you for your Toyota 4Runner this Freedom River note sheet. Can we make a deal? Okay. That's how ridiculous this trade was that, that just happened right here. Uh, a bowl, a birthright for a bowl? Come on. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, he was about to die. Fatal mistake. Fatal mistake. Well, so this is a cautionary tale then, really. This, God left this in. God wrote this in. God made sure we got it in because he wanted us to, to, to be cautioned, I think, about mistakes that we make in life that, that at the time they don't seem terrible to us, but they end up being fatal mistakes in our life because Esau never got the birthright back. He never got it again. He lost it forever with this, with this incident that we just read about just in that little naive moment of fatal mistake. So I want us to look at, at three cautions concerning the fatal mistakes we make in life, all right? So the, these three things that I'm gonna name will cause you to make fatal mistakes. So be cautious about this. Number one, beware of mistaking growth for maturity or age for wisdom. Don't think just because someone's big that they're mature or that they're old that that makes them wise, all right? That, that's, a, that's a fatal mistake. Let, look at verse 27. So the boys grew. Well, of course, this means obviously they grew in stature uh, and they grew in age. But when you look at the story that just happened, you have to be asking yourself, how old are these boys? Are these boys like young teenagers? Are they 13 years old? Because if they were young teenagers, then we could certainly understand why they could do something as dumb as just happened right here. I mean, that would totally explain why this kind of thing could happen because when you're 13 or 14 or 15, you know, especially young teenagers, you, you can do some really, really dumb things. But would it surprise you to know that these boys, at the time they did this deal right here, they were in their 60s? These were 60-year-old boys. They grew up, they grew up, really? <laughs> yeah. Esau, it says, became a skillful hunter. So Esau became real good at killing his dinner, but he, he didn't learn how to control his appetite. He got, he got real good at what he did, uh, he just didn't grow in who he was. And so he ended up forfeiting everything because his skill as a hunter grew, but his character evidently didn't grow at all. So Esau is a skillful hunter. He was skilled. Could we, could we say it this way? He was gifted. He's a, he's a gifted uh, hunter. So it becomes a cautionary tale about, about how to be responsible for your giftings. 
because God has gifted all of us. And I know you may be sitting there saying, well, I'm not gifted. Yes, you are. God gifted you. If you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, you're gifted. And what God has also done is he's given some opportunities even beyond giftings to have certain privileges in life. Like, you know, some, some people are blessed to have money. Well, maybe they grew up with money. Maybe they inherited money. Maybe they uh, won the lottery. Maybe they backed into money somehow. But even though they have money, they've never learned how to manage the money, so they waste the gift, they squander it away because they don't know how to control and be responsible for the gift and the opportunities that God has given them. Some of, some of you, and I'm gonna to talk to the people out there on the, in the cameras, some of you, because it's certainly not any of you, some of you are good at making friends. You're just not good at keeping friends because you don't know how to return phone calls because you don't understand that the responsibility of a friend is to reciprocate every now and then. In other words, you do something good for me, I do something good for you. That's the way friendships work, sacrificing for someone else. You don't write bad stuff on the internet about them. You don't say bad things in tweets and all of these other things. So as though you've got, you've got the gifts, you've got the personality, you've got the wonderful life, you just, you just don't know how to be a friend. So these boys grew up. Really? <laughs> Did they? Did they? Wow, 60 years old. 60 years old? Making a deal like this. So don't mistake growth for maturity, or age for wisdom. All right, here's a second caution. Beware of unsatisfied appetites that become exaggerated emotions. Oh yeah, unsatisfied appetites. Things that you desire, things that you want, things that remain unsatisfied. Create in us exaggerated emotions. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 27. So the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. Now, Isaac is the picture of a father who favors the child. Why, why did... Why did why did Isaac favor Esau? Well, it just told us because Esau brought home the game. Esau brought the food home. And Isaac loved the food that his son brought home. So he favored Isaac. He loved Isaac more than Jacob because Jacob stayed at the house and Isaac was the one that went out and brought the goods home. So Isaac then here becomes a picture of a father who favors the child that brings home the goods. The child that makes the good grades, the child that's a great athlete, the child that uh, is loved and out throughout the community. I mean, the guy that, the child that brings the trophies home. Isaac is a picture of one of these, these uh, what do they call them? Uh, these driven parents, uh, the word I'm looking for, uh, helicopter. Isaac's a picture of one of these, uh, these helicopter parents that care more about what their child does than who their child is. But Rebecca loved Jacob. So Jacob has his own special relationship with his mother. She comforts him. She coddles him. She pampers him. She pets him. Don't worry about your father and Esau, honey. They are just both big hairy men. So Jacob developed skills too. But they're domestic skills. He could cook. Verse 29, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field whoo, and was weary. He was famished. He was thirsty. He was a... E Esau did what he always does. This was common for Esau. Esau just ran his life to the ragged edge. Never considered anything that might be necessary so that he could... 
He could be different than being famished and, and worn out and thirsty and desperate. And this is how he always acted. He just took life for granted and pushed it to the limit. And he comes in now at the end of the day and he throws himself on that table and he is just, whoo, famished. Which makes him, shall we say, vulnerable. Oh yeah, he's, he, he's open to some, uh, he's open to some, uh, some vulnerabilities in his life now. He, yeah, he, he can be, there can be some suggestions made to him because he's beside himself so hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, uh-oh. So now Esau's talking to Jacob. Caution. Be careful who you talk to when you're in a vulnerable state of mind. If you reach out to the wrong person, if you hear the wrong voice, you're gonna make a poor decision every time, Esau. Don't talk to Jacob. Jacob is trouble, son. Jacob, you remember? Jacob had a hold of your foot when you both came out of the womb. I don't think Jacob has your best interest at heart. Please feed me with that same red stew, for I'm weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. So Esau is an impulsive man. Feed me with that red stew because I'm about to starve to death. He, Esau was the kind of person that knew what he wanted, who was headstrong and, and forceful about what he desired and what he want. I want what I want when I want it. Now give me some stew. Susceptible, vulnerable. If Tristan was here this morning, I was going to ask him, but maybe it's good that he wasn't because I don't want to put him on the spot and embarrass him. I was going to ask Tristan, if you're watching, I was just going to ask him, he's, he's in the car business. I was going to ask him, don't you love to see somebody like Esau walk into your showroom? Somebody that knows what they want. I got to have that. Give me that right there. And the salesman goes, ooh, yeah. That's a vulnerability there. I can get a lot more out of this dude because he wants that and that's all he wants. So, <laughs> That's the kind of man, evidently, Esau was. And he says to Jacob, give me my food. And, and, and so Jacob makes an offer. Here comes, here comes a salesman with an offer. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. <laughs> I'm thinking, Esau, you big hairy man, you big hairy hunter, Jacob is a sissy cook. Just beat him up and take the stew from him. I mean, when you read this, didn't you think that? I mean, look, Jacob's a little mama's boy. Just punch him in the nose, take the whole pot, and you don't have to give him anything. But Esau's weak and he's vulnerable. See, this is what, this is what vulnerability will do to you. This is what, what, this is what fatigue and, and, and annoyance and, and being uh, physically and emotionally down, that's what it'll do to you. And Esau said... Look, I'm about to die. So Esau turned from a big hairy man into a little drama queen, right? <laughs> Look, I'm about to die. So what is the birthright to me? Okay, here's your unsatisfied appetites creating exaggerated emotions. What brought Esau to this weak, vulnerable condition? It was because... He has been careless about his appetites and he has allowed himself to get too hungry. Do you remember, does anybody remember those old Lance snack machines? About this tall, about this wide, and they had the glass, and they had the little white uh, panel across the top and it had a slogan on it. Do you remember the slogan? Don't go round hungry written right on the front of the snack machine. Don't go round hungry. I thought it was kind of ironic when I saw that because I'm thinking, the snack machine is telling me something that's going to run itself out of business because if I don't go round hungry, then I wouldn't be standing here in front of a snack machine reading the phrase, don't go round hungry, thinking about buying some of that junk in that snack machine. And the only reason I'm going to think about it is because I am so hungry. 
If you go around hungry, listen, if you go around hungry, you'll eat junk. That's just all it boils down to. Tonight, your refrigerator is going to call you. I don't know what time it might be, but you're going to get a calling from your refrigerator, and it's not going to be from the broccoli. It's going to be from the bluebell, right? <laughs> Come get me. Ooh. Because when you get too hungry, uh, you'll just reach out and grab the first thing that, that, that presents itself. You know the reason why we're in such bad state, shape spiritually and we're bad shape in our spirit and our soul, how we can just get out of shape altogether? It's not because we're bad people. It's because we let ourselves get too hungry. And there's no excuse to get hungry in these days that we live in. Man, you could get a snack on every corner. There are podcasts and and, and sermons on YouTube and sermons on our website. And uh, I mean, there are books. And I mean, there's just everything available. There's no reason. You can pick up a snack anytime. So why did all this happen? Because you were so hungry, you get too hungry, and you start talking yourself into forfeiting your faith. Have you ever known that? Look, Esau says, hey, I'm about to die. What good is my birthright? Hey, I'm in serious condition here. I know what God said, but that doesn't matter anymore because I'm past that point of return. You just start talking to yourself crazy like that and you forfeit things that are important to you. And I feel for Esau. I believe I know how Esau feels. I mean, it's really hard to honor God with a, with, with a big old bowl of the devil's counterfeit you know, staring you right there in your face. Esau comes in, he's sniffing, you know, he's smelling, boy, it just smells good. And when you're starving, everything smells good. I mean, you'd die for a, for a, 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 a Brussels sprout or, or even a piece of nasty cauliflower at that particular time because you're, you're starving. Unsatisfied appetites create exaggerated emotions. I wrote down this little thing and I'm gonna read it to you because I don't wanna just skip around on it. But listen to this. I thought about this. I said, this is exactly what happens. All right, listen. You start thinking, unsatisfied appetites create exaggerated emotions. Now follow this. This is like real life. You start thinking. Let me go back here. Yeah, you start thinking. Maybe I'll never be married but I don't want to be alone forever. And you go out and you try to find anything. You'll accept anything. Beans for your birthright. Man, when your life is empty, you let people put anything in it. Just fill it up, please. I'm thinking if Esau had just one friend with him that day, just someone to say, hey, Esau, this, this is ridiculous. Walk away, man. Let's go to Taco Land. Don't trade your birthright for a bowl. Verse 33, then Jacob said, swear to me this day. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils and he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Look, I thought I, I, thought I underlined that. But you can see it. Then he ate. Look, look at how it's described. Now, this is a momentous event here. Esau just sold his birthright. Half the wealth of a rich daddy and all the prestige and honor that goes with having the birthright, and he just sold it for a bowl of, of, of beans, and all the scripture says about it was, then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. It doesn't even note whether he enjoyed it or not. It's just such a matter of fact little event in that one little moment of time, in that brief little, little matter of moments, Esau sells the birthright and Jacob becomes the owner of the birthright. Why? Because Esau allowed himself to get so hungry that nothing mattered to him except the food. And then it began to play on his emotions and his emotions drove him to make decisions that were not, to, uh, not of his best interest. So don't have unsatisfied appetites. They get your emotions out of whack and you'll make crazy choices. Here's the third one, here's the last one. Beware 
of temptation to give up what you want most for what you want now. Now that's what happened to Esau. Esau gave up what he wanted most for what he wanted now. And this kind of thing happens to us. We give away our birthright. We, we give away our testimony. We give away our integrity, our legacy, our family for a bowl. And I'm just here today to say, don't do it. It's a bad, it's a bad deal. Now maybe you're thinking, well, I don't have a birthright. Well, yes, you do. Let me show it to you. Peter tells us what it is in 1 Peter 1. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here comes our inheritance now. Here's our birthright. To an inheritance incorruptible, which means non-perishable, and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So God has reserved something for me that is, that is incorruptible and it's undefiled and it doesn't fade away and he put my name on it and it's mine. So what kind of inheritance do I have? Well, look at what Paul said in Ephesians 1. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, here it is, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So my inheritance and my blessing is that God has set aside some things and purposed some things and designed some things for me and put my name on it and they are mine. So there are three things you can do with a birthright. You can give it away, you can double it, or you can transfer it. Let me say that again. You can give it away, you can double it, or you can transfer it. Notice that I didn't say you could, it could be taken away. A birthright can't be taken away. It has to be given away. The devil can't come in and take our birthright. We have to give it away. Well, who would ever do that? Who would ever give their birthright away for a bowl? My goodness, the devil can't take it, but I can give it away. Well, I think this is the kind of thing we do all the time. We trade our birthright for a bowl. Let, let me give you for instance. For instance, God has given us peace. You know, it's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Peace, peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit that God has given us. Jesus even made a big deal out of it when he left the earth, when he was talking to his disciples in John 14. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So peace is an inheritance. It's a birthright. He gives it to us. Jesus left it for us. His peace in the midst of problems, in the midst of storms, in the midst of hopeless situations. And Paul said in Philippians, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But the devil comes and says, uh, I'll trade you. I'll trade you a bowl of worry for your peace. And God's given us joy. Joy is also one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Peter says it this way in, in 1 Peter 1. Though now you do not see him, talking about Jesus, so you're not seeing him right now face to face, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And who can forget, Nehemiah, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the devil can't take your joy away what he does is he offers you a, 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 a bowl of, a, of grumpy soup for, for your joy. Let me have a, you'll trade the joy for a bowl of grumpy soup? Yeah. God's given us a testimony. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, said this. 
you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But the devil offers us a bowl of anger or a bowl of pride or a, or a bowl of jealousy. I'll trade, you a, I'll trade you a temper tantrum for your testimony. We have bowls in our faces all day long. And these bowls are just an opportunity for us to give up what we want most for what we want now. So are we being a little too hard on our boy Esau? I mean, are we being a little too critical about Esau? Well, let's look at what the writer of Hebrews said about him. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, you know, that's the hall of faith, that's a, whole, that's a list of all these people who did these great things by faith. They followed the promises of God and God blessed them and they did great things and they're all listed in chapter 11. When you come to chapter 12, you get some warnings. And one of the little sections of warnings is um, about allowing your spiritual vitality, your, your, your enthusiasm in your life to just sink. And, it, and it's, it starts telling you how to keep your your spiritual vitality. But here's what I want you to see. There's in, in that little discussion, there is a pretty shocking statement. And let, me, let me read it, put it up on the board. Yeah. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled lest there be any fornicator or godless person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Godless person like Esau? We think of Esau as a loser. Yeah. I mean, he made a bad deal. Poor, poor negotiation skills. So we think of him as a loser, and certainly he was, but... Jacob also lost something. Oh, he got the birthright. Yeah, he, he got the birthright. But he also planted a seed that would grow a root of bitterness that would spring up and cause trouble for the rest of existence on this earth. From Esau... Edom would spring. The Edomites. The Edomites were the most constant antagonist of Israel throughout the, throughout their, the whole Old Testament. Every time Israel turned around, an Edomite was peering over a cactus or around from a rock. And even though the Edomites as a people have been lost today as a, as a group, you can't locate them. Many Bible scholars feel that there is still a group of people that are alive that are antagonizing Israel. Even today, say the Palestinians, Esau's, according to, to most historians, is the father of the Palestinians. So Jacob planted a seed that would grow a root of bitterness and that root of bitterness would cause trouble for the rest of the days. And godless like Esau. Jacob loses, Esau loses. That's the way the devil's work is. Everybody loses. Nobody wins with the devil. And godless like Esau. It, 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 it's as if the writer of Hebrews is riding along, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he comes to the phrase, and godless like, let's see, who can we use for that? Who is the most godless person we know? 
Oh, uh, who could it be? Who could, who could it be that the Hebrews would know and it would express immediately that this person just forsook everything of God and is a godless person? Oh, I know, Esau. Now, how would you like to be known for that? The most godless person that the Holy Spirit can think about to write and don't be godless like, I mean, names could have been in there. But he names Esau, and Esau now is known for being a godless person. You remember last week that I quoted what Mo, what. Moses asked God, and then God told him to say, Moses said, who, who, who do I say sent me? And, and God said, tell him I am sent you. Tell him I am. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But remember, Esau was the firstborn. It should have said, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, and I'm the God of Esau. But Esau sold his birthright over a bowl, and even though it could have said the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, and it should have said the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, it didn't say that, but it did say that Esau is godless. Verse 16, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, one single meal, one single moment of time, he sold his inheritance. Now, if you wonder what happened about this, look at the next verse, verse 17. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. He was so torn up later about this thing that he tried to repent of it, but he couldn't repent of it even though he cried about it. He was so emotional, it just tore him up, but it, it couldn't, he couldn't change this decision that he had made. So the warning is, walk away from the bowl. Don't consider the bowl. It's a bad deal. You're not gonna like it. But let, me, let me end by saying this before, before we pray. There are two more sons in the scripture. We don't know their names, but they're still pretty famous. Jesus talked about them in Luke's, in a parable in Luke 16. Jesus said there was a father that had two sons and the youngest one of the sons couldn't wait for his father to die. He wanted what he wanted now. And he came to his father and said, I need my inheritance. And his dad gave it to him. And he went away and he spent all of his inheritance on all, drinking all kind of bowls that the devil offered him. And one of those days, the bowls ran out, which they always do. And he was so hungry that the scripture said that he would have filled his stomach with the husk that belonged to the pigs that he was feeding. And no man gave him anything and he came to himself. And when he came to himself, really, that's what this series is about, really. It's about coming to yourself. Because look, you're never gonna come to God unless you first come to yourself. Who am I? What am I? Am I real? Am I counterfeit? Am I playing some kind of plastic Jesus game? Am I the real thing or am I a Jacob dressed up in Esau's clothing? And he came to himself. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's servants are well fed and I'm starving to death? I'll go back with my hat, back home with my hat in my hand because I'm not worthy to be a son. Maybe daddy will let me be one of his servants. At least he feeds his servants. But while he was on his way home, he was met with mercy. You know, they say God will meet you halfway. Now we know that's not true, right? 
God comes where you are and carries you all the way. And his dad comes running towards him. And then there's a super embarrassing public display of affection. And, um, and he said, my boy's hungry. Go kill the fatted calf, start the music. Let's get this party started because my boy that was dead is alive. I thought he was gone and now he's been found. And I don't like these nasty clothes he has on him. Get a robe and put a robe on him. Get, get that nasty junk off of him. Give him, a, give, him a, give him a ring. Yeah, put it on his finger and get those shoes. Get, get some shoes on his feet. Let's celebrate because my boy that I thought was dead is alive again. Now look at this. Here's one son, Esau, who made a bad decision and lost everything and couldn't get it back, even though he wept for it. Even though he tried, he couldn't get it back. Then there's this other son who got his inheritance early, left home, lost it all, and when he starts starving to death, he comes back and he not only gets everything back, he gets even more. So what's the difference? It wasn't like these boys had different attitudes. Esau regretted what he did and tried to get back and even wept about it. He came to the altar and cried big crocodile tears over it. And the boy that left home didn't come back because he loved his daddy. He came back because he was hungry. So what's the difference? Why could one not get it back and the other could get it back and even more? Well, the difference is another son. An on, as a matter of fact, an only son. And John tells us about him for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This other son also left his home and he went out into the wilderness to be tempted by the tempter and he was isolated and he was lonely and he was hungry and the tempter came to him and said, take this bowl for your birthright. Command that these stones be made bread. And Jesus looked at him and said, I don't need your bowl. I am the bread. And because Jesus never wavered, he has an inheritance to give us because he didn't give his away. We gave ours away. We frivoled it away. We frittered it away. We carelessed it away. We neglected it away. We squandered it. But Jesus says, I got your birthright and I'll give it to you. I'll return it to you. It's a better word. It used to be ours. I'll return it to you. All you have to do is believe. That's him. And ask him. Two boys. Yep. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> oh, that's it. All right, bow your head with me.